Hi, Ori. So today I would like to talk with you over the your kind of history with Plan 9, the Plan 9 community and how this is kind of formed around your life and how the, your experiences with the community have affected you, your programming, and just in general, the effect it's had upon you as a person. Um, do you want to start uh, telling a little bit about yourself? Uh, sure. So my name's Ori. I've been touching computers for a living for a long time. Uh, actually, not that long compared to a lot of people in this community. Uh, so probably I've been programming for about half my life, which means about 15 years at this point. Uh, I kind of have been exploring things for ages. And, uh, you know, when I was probably in my late teens, I was messing around with Linux and then eventually Unix and came across Plan 9, started playing with it. Nice. Uh, li I liked it and kind of stuck around on and off as the things I was doing were practical or not on Plan 9. And probably around 2018, enough stuff became practical with Ninefront and code that I wrote and whatever else that today it's probably the system I end up spending the most time on. Nice. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, that's nice. Uh, so, so you use it more now than you did before. Yes. Yeah. So do you, what, do you think, uh, is there anything in particular with that, uh, that you think influenced your ability to make that transition? Was there any breaking point specifically, or has it just been kind of the trend of like community mass and production moving forward? Uh, really the big thing that kind of allowed me to make the transition was sitting up finally writing a usable SSH client. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, with that, there were a lot of tools to actually kind of glue together Unix when I needed it, like when I was doing Android development and I actually needed to run the compiler, for example. <laughs> um, right. Um, or being able to actually just copy stuff and, yeah, basically yeah. just interfacing with all the parts that didn't and still don't often run on Plan 9. Right. And do you, do you think this is just like uh, the new SSH client? Do you use the SSHFS a lot? I know in the grand scheme of things, that's kind of a recent addition by the Nine Front folks. Uh, yeah, that's definitely useful. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, basically, I can talk about my setup. I'm sure that you'll, that'll come up later too. So. Yeah, we, we, could go, we could go over that in a robust detail for sure. Yeah. Um, so I guess a little background then still, uh, how, do you, how did you kind of first hear about Plan 9? It's okay if this wasn't like a singular experience, but maybe what was your first like exposure even before you had interacted with it maybe? I don't remember. <laughs> that's okay, that's okay. Um, um, I mean, you know, I can give you a date, which would probably be around 2000 six or so when I was really just diving into when I had finally gotten off of the windows environment, that, <laughs> you know, everyone grew up on. Right. Of course. Uh, it, and kind of was exploring and learning how to program. And so basically, you know, I was reading about everything that I could. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm pretty sure I came across plan nine then. And at one point, I ended up trying it on a machine and, you know, yeah. play, played with it. A um, couple of years later, I, yeah. Actually, there is one big part of the Plan 9 history that, or my history with Plan 9 that I think I forgot to mention, which oh, sure. definitely uh, had an influence mm -hmm. uh, in, was it? Either 2008 or 2009, mm -hmm. I got the chance to do an internship at Bell Labs working on it. Oh, yeah. So that was, I, to be honest, I was a shitty intern. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
I, I think that's like a pretty standard experience for uh, like interns, especially somewhere like Bell Labs. That's kind of like a big place to have like an internship at, especially. Yeah, I mean, so much, so, so much talent. Yeah, but basically, I mean, at that point, it was already clear that Bell Labs was kind of sinking. Uh. Um, at the same time, you know, the Titanic may be going down, but the band was still playing some nice music. Right. <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> well, uh, if you don't mind talking about it, then uh, do who do is there any like people of interest that maybe from a historical perspective? Did you? I uh, I I think it was Geoff was there for a long time. Yeah, uh, Jeff. Jeff, sorry. Uh, so Jeff was around. Uh, Jim McKee. Uh, Dennis was still uh, kind of hanging out and he wasn't he was still he was officially retired but he showed up occasionally oh sure um actually there was a whole bunch of uh, alumni that would show up on fridays for cookies oh cute <laughs> um so uh al aho would be around every now and then mm -hmm. uh the guy who wrote the dragon book oh yeah 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 um there were a few uh cryptographers forgetting their names that's okay <laughs> but yeah there were definitely a bunch of interesting people that, interesting. and not just doing uh plan nine right um who else yeah. yeah john hobby who had a bunch of interesting graphics papers okay okay yeah um i don't know there was a lot to learn yeah <laughs> i believe it yeah i just really wish that at the time my work habits had been a lot better <laughs> That's okay. I think uh, it's a it's a lot to ask uh, of interns in a lot of cases like that. It's uh, I doubt anyone would ever blame you. Um, I think most people would probably be the same. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, so so were you working directly on Plan Nine then, or is it just adjacent? Or no, I was directly on Plan Nine. Uh, okay. Jeff was uh, my manager. I guess. Oh, I see. Sure, sure. Wow. And Jeff was the last to leave, I think, from the labs, too, of the nine um, folks. Yeah, probably. Yeah, that sounds about right. Uh, interesting. Uh, and you really been, I, I guess, trying to line all the dates up. Had you had, like, much experience with nine beforehand or just kind of a vague knowledge of what it was? Uh, I had been running it and trying to do some stuff with it, but it wasn't like I was experienced or really knew my way around the system at the time. That's fair. That's fair. Um, interesting. Nice. So you kind of got exposed to the labs culture early on. Yeah. Um, and that's probably had a really big influence on how to, how I approach writing code. Um, if you don't mind, uh, how do you think you'd articulate that? Like, do, do you think that it's just the, way that the labs folks went about writing code or like kind of a philosophical thing practical nine or otherwise i suppose uh i don't i'd have to think about that one. sure that's okay um <laughs> i mean but... there's definitely like picking up the style and approach to factoring problems i think is a big part of it mm -hmm. um so it wasn't like there is an explicit philosophy that got stated right um definitely um but there was but you know there you can look at the code that someone that uh is in plan nine versus say open bsd versus google versus whatever <laughs> else and there's always kind of a uh style to it right and it's not actually one of my pet peeves, people keep on talking about code style as though it's just indentation. Mm -hmm. And no, <laughs> there's really just, yeah. There's, there are different ways that the code actually gets structured right. at different places. And yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Um, yeah. So, uh, I, I, so then moving on, a little bit what would you say like what was the first maybe really significant program you think you wrote for plan nine that like if something 
sticks in your head that like maybe it was the first complete like uh utility you put together or something for entertainment where it was you felt that it was maybe like a cohesive piece and maybe this is a me projecting a bit because i think when i first learn about like a language or a system i can I, I i try i try a lot of things initially and they don't work so well even with nine i had uh to get handheld a little bit by folks like mischief to get bio to working for me and i can remember that being like a really big hiccup just for me even though it sounds trivial in retrospect uh do you have maybe a first like kind of aha or cohesive piece of satisfaction that you saw come out uh that is a good question um so there were definitely a whole bunch of small programs i've written little utilities um trying to fix bugs but also but i think the first like major i have got something finished and it's kind of significant was probably porting uh my programming language, uh, Mirden, sure. over to Plan 9. Um, and that was done using Ape, so <laughs> I don't know how... <laughs> I, But I don't know how much to Plan 9 you would count that, but Ape was just for the compiler. Right. Um, and then, you know, you have to make that actually generate Plan 9 assembly in the compiler, and then because of the way that uh, I was designing it, right. uh, designing the language and the runtime, hmm. it doesn't depend on libc, which means that I had to kind of come up with a way of, well, come up with the abstractions and the standard library design and the system call layer and so on. Right. And make it all work both on Plan 9 and Unix and kind of, have the appropriate uh, portability, uh, sort of, uh, the appropriate approach to portability. Right. Um, so that was definitely a learning experience. <laughs> I can imagine. You know, uh, I think Meriden, if I'm saying it right, uh, was probably like one of the first non C languages I touched on Plan 9 because you. Well, you probably ported that just around when I started like writing like any software at all on Plan 9 in any sizable amount uh, past going to be a little observer. Um, and I really appreciate that. I I think uh, Meridian's a very interesting language. Um, what... what so, so obviously it was very challenging getting it to build on two platforms. Just how different was it trying to get it to run on plan nine because plan nine uses like a dot out as like a binary format uh, i don't know how big of an effect that has um your challenges and there's so many things in nine that just don't exist uh that would exist in like unix is that did, did you find that you had to like constrain a lot of things or was it a big constricting effect trying to get it to work on nine or did it fall together a little easier than you expected um, so it wasn't, so I ported it early enough that the hard things were done after I had Plan 9 support, <laughs> Okay. Uh, which makes it a lot easier because that meant that the libraries could be designed to work in both places at once, mm. as opposed to kind of trying to shoehorn in, say, pull and select, which don't exist on native plan nine and are omitted by design. Right. Of course, of course. Right. Um, so not to go, well, I have this code and it doesn't really fit. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, if I can actually design things to, so that everything does fit, right. Then typically it's actually been a lot easier to make things work on plan nine than, <laughs> than on the <laughs> Unix side of things. Right. Um, for example, IPv6 was always, a, actually, I recently got a patch from a user, but until very recently, IPv6 was definitely wonky and rude on Unix. 
Um, there was some bugs around parsing IPv6 addresses into something that would work for a socket mm -hmm. um, because socket a the socket API is basically based around designed in buffer overflows. Hey, we've got this type that's a little too small, but based on the but we switch on the a byte in the header that tells us what type it actually <laughs> is. Uh, yeah. Um, separate rant. Um, but on plan nine, because of the way that uh, the connection server interacts with uh, everything else, it just worked. Nice. And the same goes for things like graphics. Libdraw is a lot smaller than, or not libdraw, but the draw API is a lot mm. smaller and cleaner and easier to implement than X11. Yeah, I believe that. I have both working. <laughs> uh, well, text still isn't working on X11 because text is hard on X11. Right. Is text <laughs> easy on uh, Plan 9, you'd say, proportionally then? Proportionally. Yeah. Uh, there are a bunch of things that Plan 9 doesn't do with text that would be kind of nice, mm. like uh, right to left. Mm hmm but there's definitely a lot less effort in getting something working. Right. That makes sense. Um, and just we my backtracking a little bit here because people that listen may not be familiar. Uh, Ape is the ANSI POSIX environment uh, for Plan 9 that allows you to build kind of Unixy things on Plan 9 without fully rewriting them in the standard library for Plan 9. Uh, and then you had mentioned that things we don't have like select and pull. Uh, how would, I, I, I guess if you had to kind of summarize the uh, structure there that exists in Unix but doesn't exist in Plan 9, do you maybe have a concise way of summarizing that, Ori? Um, the structure. Um, like uh, what select does that Plan 9 maybe has an equivalency or deliberate absence for? Because we had mentioned that they were explicitly omitted. By design. Oh yeah, yeah. So it maybe uh, what Plan Nine chooses instead, or how the how it avoids having to make that choice in the first place. Yeah, sure. So for Plan Nine, if you want to do things in parallel, just do things in parallel. Grab, create a new thread. Uh, and for Unix, there's this idea of you know having file descriptors tell you when they're ready so that you can do an IO on them, and hopefully it doesn't block. <laughs> um, so it's just a different way of structuring your program to do things mm -hmm. in parallel. Right. Um, and in some sense, it does cost a little bit of performance on Plan 9. Mm -hmm. um, and it causes some awkwardness around libthread, which is a downside. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um specifically uh if you want to do non if you want to do uh blocking IO in a libthread program, you'll probably want to use an IO proc, which is basically a process that'll do the reads and writes in the background for you, but it's not transparent and it's not and if you happen to be calling into a C library that just calls read and write, mm. it's gonna block. <laughs> Right. <laughs> um, so, yeah, there are some downsides to the Plan Nine decisions, and I feel like, uh, sorry, I have no some worries. In the background. <laughs> uh, it'll go for another thirty seconds. That's okay. We can take a breather. <laughs> <laughs> no worries at all. For those listening in, it is now three o'clock. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> I'm gonna say that the view outside of the window kind of gives, I see I can see a nice looking church. Oh that's right. the upside. Yeah. The downside is that I can hear a nice looking church. Oh yes. <laughs> I understand. Um I used to live by a church, I get it. Um it's uh kind of nice, wakes me up from my reverie, but then this happens, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. 
and I think we're good. Excellent, excellent. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I was just going to say LibThread um, has a bunch of nice ideas, but there are a bunch of things that I wish that we could figure out how to solve. Right. Like being able to do blocking reads. Right. And uh, but judging by the uh, figure out how to solve, I'm guessing, and to be fair, I don't know that much about how these sorts of systems are designed under the hood. Uh, I'm going to go on a limb here and guess that that is a non-trivial problem to solve from a Plan 9 perspective. Correct. Yeah. Um, it'll probably involve changing the system calls or at, le at the minimum it would involve some hacks overriding, overriding the read and write signal, uh, not signals, read and write functions right. in libc so that you could transparently hand it off to a separate process. Right. And then you've got synchronization yeah. overhead and it may or may not end up being a good idea. Right. Did you find, though, that, uh, and maybe with uh, Meriden and perhaps in other places, uh, do you feel, how how do you feel about, like, Plan 9's asynchronous model in general, though? Because it is very, I, I, I know a lot of people like to cite, and myself included, the kind of CSP communicating sequential processes elements in it. There's, the, like, alt statements, um, but they're not nearly as clean in the C there as you might say they are in, like, even new squeak or limbo or go uh do you use those very often do you write more kind of uh posixy asynchronous code um i tend to write well how do i put it mm -hmm. the elegance of those apis it bothers me a little bit but at the same time I tend to write mostly sequential code. Right. Um, the communication between threads tends to be very localized and very structured in the code that I write. Um, the way I kind of like phrasing, well, a lot of approaches to programming or a lot of fancy features, mm. they're, like, they're like salt when you're cooking. <laughs> so, and what I mean by that is, if you add a little bit of them in the right places, your food's going to end up taste, tasting a lot better, or your pro, your code's going to end up tasting a lot better. If you sprinkle it without uh, care everywhere, things are just going to be a mess. <laughs> yeah, things are right. going to be way over salted, way. And so, with concurrency, usually the first thing I think about is the scheme of what's communicating with what. Mm -hmm. And then I try to put that into a few connected uh, communicating like loops of state. Right. And then everything else ends up being um, kind of sequential, boring. <laughs> um, you know, you tell the computer what you're going to do, then you tell it what you're going to do next. Right. And then you wait for the event in the main loop and do the next thing. Pretty traditional procedural style code, yeah? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. Um, but then when you want to do things... Actually, let's pick a concrete example. Sure. Uh, I recently re rewrote Acme Mail because, well, I want to be able to keep track of uh, threads. That was being becoming a real pain in the ass. Um, yeah, I can see that. You know, what would happen a lot was someone would send me an email uh, responding, you know, and then they'd send me a patch. I'd respond with a bit of code review. They'd respond with something else, and then I'd want to go back and look at the initial patch. Right. And it was a pain in the ass digging through a week of mail to find the initial email. So Right. <laughs> so threads. Right. Um, so I started trying to add that to Acme Mail, and it turns out threads and linked lists, which was their central data structure, don't play that well together. So I just started rewriting it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and I think three days later, I had something that worked. Mm. Um, but basically, what ends up happening with the Acme Mail. Mm. Um, or with the new nail client, which is what I was calling it, mm. um, 
nail, new mail, <laughs> just kind of mashed together. Yeah. Um, and basically, what happens there is that there's, for every window, there's one main loop. Mm -hmm. uh, the main loop in the message window reads from the plumber of the uh, the Acme events file and a couple of other event sources. Mm. And I very and I designed it so that that would spawn off a completely independent, uncommunicating thread with uh, uh, for each message that you were viewing. And that would just talk with the uh, Acme stuff, uh, the Acme uh, event data. Mm. Um, actually, the kind of brings to mind. So the Go motto is apparently share by communicating. Yes. The way that I try to approach designing multi-threaded code is don't share, don't talk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, if you don't have to communicate, you don't have to co coordinate communication. Mm -hmm. um, and then obviously there are some points where you do need to communicate, but the goal of designing the program should be figuring out how you can minimize that communication or minimize the need for communication sure. and then structure the whatever's left. Mm -hmm. And that means that there's less to reason about. Hmm. Interacting state machines are hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, certainly. Yeah, concurrently too, it certainly doesn't make it easier. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that is, it is nice that uh, the plan nine lib thread, if you're running in the same proc, you can do basically as much as you want atomically until you actually do some IO. That is nice, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Nice. It does hurt performance, but, <laughs> but yeah, but yeah. So but it, yeah, performance is you know not the well. If perform if the performance of doing things in parallel for rearranging a few windows is your bottleneck. Your code needs some help. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, 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 and, and that makes sense. Um, makes sense. I, I, yeah. Uh, nice, nice, nice. So let me see. Let's uh, let me see if I can pull something out real quick. Uh, I guess yeah. maybe stepping further on this, since we've been talking about libthread for a second now. Do you kind of have a a favorite? And this can be favorite from a design or like novelty uh, and you can pick as many as you want like program abstraction library something in plan nine that uh to 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 use a common phrase like spark sparks joy in you or otherwise it gives you a great deal of satisfaction i mean just the uh whole read write and you know open close read write api that you use to interact with files yeah it's simple easy to use it stood the test of time uh it really just gets the job done yeah yeah it's uh it's, it's it is really nice isn't it having just everything at your fingertips as file semantics um well, let's see what so when you when you write software have you, or, or ported software or whatnot to plan nine uh, what kind of things do you, you find yourself like using the most utility wise like uh uh for porting i guess it would make sense to po point a little bit at ape and if there's anything that you find yourself leaning on a lot or even in the nine utilities you have like a like, but for example, do you do you write, use Acme a lot, uh, or just for mail? Are you one of the diehard Sam folks, or like what what kind of is your setup? I guess because we had talked about going back to how you have yourself set up and your kind of self built environment. Uh, do you want to speak to that a little bit? Yeah, sure. So I mean, with for editing code, I mostly use Sam. For uh, and then I run Acme as my mail client uh, under a ptrap instance that kind of filters out all the edit commands. 
Um, so that means that when I uh, plumb a file, it doesn't. It goes only to Sam and not to uh, Acme. Mm. Um, Sam is fine, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I've got uh, not so secret plans to write something new. Mm. Uh, I don't know when I'll get to them, but they're plans. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, they're somewhere on the list with everything else that I want to do. <laughs> um, so don't get excited. It's nice <laughs> years before I start. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, um, mostly I use RC and a Rio window for running code. Uh, you know, just, I don't know. I mean, the, my setup isn't particularly special. Right. Um, type in Sam, run in Rio, think about the output, maybe add some prints if it's not what I expected it, maybe not. Uh, if things crash, get a uh, backtrace from actually a little shell script that I wrote that uh, grabs the stack from the last uh, crash process. Mm. Nice. Um, because um, as pulling up acid and attaching to the right process and so on is just a bit of an, a pain when 90% yeah. of the time the stack trace just tells me what I need. Yeah, exactly. Um, still need to learn acid a lot better. It's, yeah. It's a powerful tool. <laughs> <laughs> but the documentation is uh, not a good tutorial. I and agree. and it's really designed for kind of um, assembly programming in a way, mm. or not for assembly programming, but it kind of needs you to understand assembly programming and how to what it doesn't know the data type, so you really have to tell it everything. Yeah, when you're looking at what's going on. Yeah. So there's a high barrier before I actually start reaching for it. Right. Yeah, I I remember having to try. I I have some notes on Postnik somewhere of just sessions from trying to debug something in Acid because I told myself I should learn how that works. I think I was trying to figure out how to use Trust and whatever the other stock library is that uh, yeah. shows up in the manuals. Yeah, and I I remember it just being kind of like a bad dream the whole time. Yeah. I it's very interesting because it has so many procedural language structures hiding out in it and so much it feels i part of me really wants to like it a lot just because it ha it gives you so much in what feels almost like a familiar almost shell like environment um but yeah and there are a few things that it's really useful for mm. um so for example uh, with Nail again, uh, I had some really weird behavior that wasn't causing crashes and would take a few, like a day or two before it would show up. Oh, wow. So adding prints, well, turns out that once I understood it, I could make it show up a lot faster. But right. uh, basically, I wasn't deleting email messages in the, or in the order that would trigger the bug most of the time. Mm. Um, so... Basically, it would end up counting wrong to figure out where to insert a message. Oh, sure. Um, and basically, what I ended up doing there was to f to debug it was writing a little acid script that would look at the state of the message list and dump out the information I needed to actually cross-check the um, computation nice. of the message index. Mm -hmm. um, there's the little loop that kind of goes through and figures and casts all the addresses to the right type for the <laughs> <laughs> to make yeah. us happy yeah 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 so basically i think acid does a good job of what but the kind of bug that will make me break it out is a lot higher than the kind of bug. The threshold for breaking it is much higher than the threshold I'd use for, say, GDB on Unix, where I can yeah. just print, print any expression and it shows up with all the right types, and yeah. I can call a function to pretty print a dump or whatever. 
Right. So GDB I can use as like a moving printf. Yeah. Uh, Acid is a lot harder to use that way. Right. Do you think that that's just uh, Acid maybe wasn't developed enough and it has the potential to reach something like that? Or do you just envision like kind of a clean slate reapproach um, and leaving Acid where it is and building something else in the future? Um, part of it's that the Plan 9 debug info isn't quite expressive enough for some things. Oh, sure. Um, for example, the types are in a separate .acid file, which don't tell you if something is a string or not. Um, but yeah, I think acid could definitely be improved. Mm. Um, I'd kind of like something that has a more RC-like syntax that <laughs> is easier to use in a kind of interactive way. Right. Um, may actually be interesting now that it, now that that's been mentioned. It may be interesting <laughs> to try to kind of come up with a acid fs with uh rc binaries <laughs> that would let you kind of uh do the acid commands i don't know if that yeah. would work or not I, this is just an idea that popped into my head right now <laughs> yeah I, I was actually about to ask that i was like wow if you want rc syntax then it sounds like you really just want a file system since that's how that seems to play yeah. out usually yeah yeah um i don't know if, yeah i don't know if it, if it would work well or not um right I mean, who knows? <laughs> yeah, who knows? I mean, Acid sits on top of uh, just proc anyways. So, yeah. So, it yeah. seems like a logical extension. Yeah. Now, if someone does want to do a rewrite of Acid, I've got a great, <laughs> I've got a great name for them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the little system debugger, LSD. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. That's pretty good. Yeah, I like that. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I, I don't know if it was uh, deliberate or not. I don't remember if this was a... I, I don't think this was a labs joke, but uh, I remember a comment on Cat V or otherwise where someone once said uh, in response to the name Acid, they're like, oh, yeah, it's, it's named after this because Acid is for debugging the brain. And I got a good giggle out of that. Um, yeah. <laughs> I've never tried. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um... My lawyer makes me say that. Yeah, <laughs> I get it. Uh, yeah, so, so uh, yeah, this is interesting. You don't hear people talk about acid enough. I think it was a long time before I ever really had to open it up and do anything in it. And I have, I don't, I know, I, I'm pretty sure it wasn't you. And I, I strongly suspect it was mischief, though. I think he denied it. That someone wrote this mountain of go maybe they even told me who they were and i've just forgotten but a mountain of like go libraries for acid for debugging go programs back when it was still written in c on plan nine and i remember uh, i at the time uh because i entered plan nine partially because of go i think because someone on cat v or cat v adjacent had bullied me into trying it and then i had Miller's original Raspberry Pi image and Go didn't work on that yet, I don't think. But someone had been talking about Go on Plan 9 and that's how that whole thing had played out and I had learned about things and I saw these libraries for ACID. I was like, oh, debugging Go, that's very interesting. ACID, very interesting. I did not know nearly enough at the time and I remember it just being this huge pile of very delicate scripts and it just it felt like so much and then they abandoned it i think the moment that go got rewritten in go or something like that because it just all fell apart but yeah that, that's not surprising yeah <laughs> um yeah hmm. it would be really nice having a proper tutorial on how to use acid i agree there's the paper in sysdoc which is a start Right. But you have to kind of take that and mix that with the man page, and then there's still not very much in the way of kind of getting you started on even simple things like printing a string. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, this is why I have, like, my little... I, I think literally what I did for my post Nix notes is I just copied out the session from Rio in its entirety from first command to closing and put them in there, and I used that as a reference just because I could never 
keep it all quite straight. And even once you do, like you say, you need to know assembly. And the Plan 9 assemblies are very strange, aren't they? Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, part of it's not even knowing assembly, but knowing, like, if you want to get the nth index into an array, mm -hmm. um, you have to know that the size of the every element in the array is, say, 8 bytes, so then you compute the address into the... <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It requires you to think a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. And you get used to it, but especially after writing some compilers. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. 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 But yeah, not an ideal experience. Um, I think some of that could actually be solved by just kind of have enhancing the default ACID library so that it a knows the size of every type. Right. Um, possibly by gen by changing what the compiler outputs. I don't actually remember mm. if you need that or not. Um, but then you can add a bunch of say accessor functions that say print a string or print a value at an array index. Mm -hmm. And yeah, yeah, I think there's a lot of room for just little ergonomic improvements around that kind of usage. Kind of a classic scenario for the Plan 9 ecosystem in general. I think Dogstar had mentioned recently that uh, Plan 9, there might be a lot of like kind of broken or half broken things floating around that people haven't noticed, but when you need to fix them, it f doesn't feel like an insurmountable task to do so. Uh, oh, yeah. It's something yeah, that needs to be done. Yeah, that's kind of one of the things that I like. The other thing with Plan 9 that you kind of notice as you get deeper into it is that there is a lot of stuff that got done to the proof of concept stage, got done to where the authors could use it for their purposes, and then, uh, you know, never got the polish or the real, like, never got pushed to the point where it's clean and perfect. <laughs> right, right, like complete in a polished, finished, like the this is viable as like a doesn't need much changing over time. This is just like it. Um, you know, I got my paper. What what do you want? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I yeah I get yeah yeah, yeah. I, I think I agree. You see it a lot. And I mean, I, that's one of the dangers of a research system, right? Of course. And as far as research research systems go, or systems with small user bases go in general, right. This is not like Plan Nine does really well on this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like on just general polish and things working. Do you have an offhand example that you could compare to that you maybe you had a worse experience with, or what exactly you maybe missed with if you explored another kind of comparable system in this regard? Had I, I don't really have comparable systems, but just. Looking at, looking at paper and trying to make sense of stuff that people oh, have sure. published. Uh, so there's this great subreddit where uh, people post uh, systems research papers. Mm -hmm. uh, Reddit.com are systems. Okay. Um, okay. And I try to poke through and look at the interesting ones. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them are either missing the code entirely or the code is terrible or trying to get it to run is a chore. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the getting it to run is a chore thing is also something I, I've kind of, I miss a lot from Nine and the Nine ecosystem software. So much of the time, like on, I think when I first started getting exposed to software development under like POSIX, I was I felt kind of lied to when I was first learning because they're like you can just run dot slash configure and you type make and something builds and that's going to be basically it that's all you kind of need to know you have tarball on tar cd blah 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 and and to some extent I feel that is kind of true and there are tools and utilities out there for sussing out what you might be missing or configuration you might be missing but it feels like when one of those builds just doesn't work. It's, uh, I think my fight or flight starts kicking in a little bit when like big POSIX uh, library errors start rolling out from under me, especially in like GNU uh, stuff. But on like nine, yeah, even, I mean, you uh, get, <laughs> go ahead. 
yeah. No, I was going to say, yeah, over time you kind of develop some Stockholm syndrome and it kind of gets better, but... <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, like, I, I don't feel lost really so much anymore, and I, I don't feel like they're truly insurmountable, but compared to Nine, where even, like, you, you take, like, a program... I, you can take on Nine, and this I don't think this is... I, I understand why it's the case with static linking and everything, but I, I don't know if you were aware of this, but when I had gone to get like second edition up and running, I found that by uh, just by chance, the 386 second edition binaries, if you take one and you copy it over to like a modern nine front 386 system and just run it, it just, it just runs. Um, and a lot of the builds and like the MK files and everything still like work. There's obviously library differences over time, but I, I don't think I've sat down and felt quite like it. Fe it feels very attainable as an individual. I think. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think they. I can't remember who said this initially. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it was me, <laughs> but um, I think the best kind of tongue-in-cheek one-sentence description of the of plan nine was that i've heard is uh imagine that the good things they told you about unix were true <laughs> that's a classic yeah uh, i i think i've i think that might be in one of the fortune files even oh that that would explain it i think so um yeah 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 no you're absolutely right especially i mean, e even with the easy example of everything is a file but yeah going down to like make and how the compiler is make nice for you so many things right yeah or the lie that unix is a simple operator. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i i, I man uh, and going back to how much you like that like everything is just open close read write I remember even like porting uh, getting Go programs to work on nine. Sometimes, like uh, the simplest example I can think of was I just wanted uh, clipboard stuff to work for. God, I don't even know. I had I had some program going, and there was some Go module that did like clipboard handling for like Windows, Mac, Linux, whatever. And I just kind of wanted that to work on nine, and I would forked it out. I was like, okay, so I think the only thing I have to do here is write to dev snarf and read from dev snarf, and that's going to be it. And the plan nine file for this is just going to be like 30 lines tops sitting there and opening and writing and closing and flushing or whatever. Yeah, yeah that's, that sounds about right. Yeah. Um, nice. Meanwhile, I think that Keith Packard's paper on how copy and paste works on unix <laughs> was was titled and this is keith packard so i'm pretty sure the name was intentionally kind of tongue-in-cheek uh, -huh. uh but it was titled something along the lines of how to copy and paste in a thousand lines of code <laughs> <laughs> right yeah and you can see it and especially with things like x clipboard i believe it yeah, and I mean, there's there's a reason for some of it. Right. For example, DevSnarf doesn't let you, you know, copy and paste images and have the program that knows a, that, you know, getting the paste data know what kind of image format you're you put into it. Right. So, so you know, you just get yeah. text, and there are features that you lose. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Though online also, I think a lot of things are more representable through text that might not be otherwise. Oh yeah, um, for sure. Yeah. Uh, interesting. I uh, so maybe this goes with it. Go, may, I, I'm I'm gonna put on my prediction hat here and say the answer is gonna be C. But like, what language do you think you write the most in on Plan Nine? On Plan Nine, yeah, C. Yeah. Uh, followed by RC, followed by Merdin, followed by Go. Um, I think that covers all the available languages. Yeah. <laughs> well, nowadays we have kind of a nice variety. There's an OCaml port. There's My yeah. Mycroft went back and resurrected the old Hugs uh, Haskell compiler. I know he's been having a lot of fun with that, and he has like an Agda working. Yeah, like and. 
I, I can't remember who did it. I know that there is a there are actually a couple of Lua ports. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, yeah. It was tongue in cheek when I. Yes, of course. I no. I think but, you're. I think you're right, though. Um, I am that, and the Murden on Plan Nine works uh, very well in my experience, all things considered. I think I actually uh, experienced less odd functionality than when I did on like Linux. Um, if you remember, I pestered you a long time ago when I was trying yeah. to figure everything out with that. Yeah. Yeah. Part of it, again, simplicity, right. um, you know, our fork on Ply9 gets its own thread, which mean, or gets its own stack, which means that you don't have to do weird assembly games to kind of get your program started when it, or get your thread started when it doesn't yet have stack, mm, mm-hmm. which you have to do everywhere else, which is the source of a lot of bugs. <laughs> Yeah, it, we, you know, I saw you talking about R fork on IRC the other day. Uh, how how do you, you do you like R fork quite a lot? Um, I I feel like it's a very you un, not unique to Plan Nine, but very Plan Nine E kind of thing that exists. It's definitely a very Plan Nine E thing, although Linux basically cloned it for their uh, clone system call. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Except without the multiple um, threads, mm-hmm. or sorry, multiple stacks. Mm-hmm. So basically, uh, Docker is a really fancy R fork. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh my goodness. Um, yes. And so I'm probably gonna. So you were asking how I like it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I feel like anything you ask me about with the question <laughs> like that, you're gonna get. Well, I have mixed feelings. Yeah, of course. That's fair. But I think that you can't really use a system and understand it deeply without kind of having misgivings about basically every interesting part of it. Right, that's fair. Um, for example, with R fork and the and RF threat or RF proc, mm-hmm. you're sharing memory except for the stack, which means that things get weird when you try to pass data that's on the stack between things. Lib thread does kind of, does some stuff where it just mounts the stack. Now you fall off the end of the stack and you don't get a good error about it. And mm. there's upsides and downsides. Right. Um, everything sucks, but everything is kind of useful too. So yeah. Yeah. You know, that's fair. What trade offs do you make? Yeah. I and I think largely Plan Nine has made good trade offs. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's mostly why I like the system. Yeah, things the things that I hate about it are less annoying than the things I hate. About <laughs> <it>. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I I think that's fair. I think that's fair. There's certainly rough edges. Um. Uh, so you had mentioned also that the next most frequented language by you after C is RC. I think was it you that had put out uh some patches for it recently as like quality of life improvements? I know I saw some rolling around. I just haven't uh, been super very observant on the mailing threads. Yeah, no listen concatenation. Gone. <laughs> or well, it's still there, but now you know where it's coming from. Uh, uh, and for for anyone that's listening that doesn't appreciate this, uh, and or you can correct me if I'm wrong here, no list and concatenation is kind of the only error you get from RC, and you didn't even get a line number or anything helpful from it. It just falls out when you have a null list concatenated, and RC falls over and doesn't know what to do. Yeah, you do get other errors from RC, that's uh, mostly syntax errors, but mm-hmm. um, it was the most annoying one to debug because. As you said, it's just it's the most common runtime error, and it just <laughs> tells you, "Hey, you had a null list in your program somewhere." Somewhere. Oh, yeah. I have horrible, horrible uh, fever dreams of when I first got work uh, set up for nine dot postnix dot pw, and the first time I sat down and ran it, I just got null list and concatenation out of work. And I stared at, like, fresh out of the box. <laughs> I stared at that, and I just, like, took a very, very deep breath. Um, and yeah. prepared. Uh, I actually, I have a sticker on my laptop, and so does, I think, Moody. Because I, when I used, I used to work in a security lab, and me and Moody worked together there. 
and uh, we had a label printer and it's nice yellow label printer uh, almost kind of acme colors it prints it only in black text and uh, i have the rc colon space no listed concatenation printed out and sitting at the bottom of or i guess in the middle of the laptop looking at it um and very that, iconic that's a good sticker yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I i i get a good giggle out of it it's probably the fa my favorite one i have on there um yeah so it's gone you have uh did you get line numbers in uh yeah what, Nice, nice, nice. That's yeah. Basically, so RC compiles compiles to bytecode, and I just added a bytecode that sets the line number whenever the line number changes. Nice. That sounds nice. That's yeah, yeah. Enormous quality of life improvement, and I appreciate you immensely. That's I know for me, I uh, foot gun myself in RC probably more than I should, and that's like a huge like. I I, I hope that. The no line number RC errors becomes a faded memory for us and newer people might not even know that that was the case and that's okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think the, yeah, before this, the, oh, RC dash X was probably your best bet at fixing the, or finding these errors. Mm. Just look at the line that, the last line that printed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And hope for the best. Yeah. <laughs> but it's useful. <laughs> <laughs> I but it, it. Yeah. It wasn't. Yeah. Debugging shell scripts with dash X is not fun. Yeah. Yeah. That's. Heaven forbid uh, they do any like including and jumping around or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, neat. So, kind of pushing outwards, and do, we'll just go over a couple of these before I start pulling out questions that were put on grid disk and if we get any live questions I'll, i we maybe we can go through those if you'd like uh but something a little more high level and less dug in to nine uh do how do you think the ideas or architecture of play and we kind of went over this talking about how the labs culture influenced how you write software but do you think nine has had an effect on how you write software outside of nine, maybe things that are never meant to run on nine. I don't know how frequently that happens for you these days. Um, the, do you I mean, do anything explicitly differently in remembrance or structure or style? Uh, anything like that? Uh, explicitly that comes to mind. It's okay if not. I mean, if I'm right, if I get to define the style, mm -hmm. uh, I, I will basically go with the usual plan nine style in my code. Mm -hmm. Um, I have actually I definitely, well, so the last job I worked at was, uh, building smart microwaves, mm -hmm. uh, because, well, there's a whole story behind why it wasn't just, let's make these, uh, microwaves vulnerable to, uh, attacks. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, there was actually some interesting physics going on in trying to cook the food better. Oh, I see. Um, but basically, that microwave ran off of uh, the Plan 9 9P implementation. Oh, interesting. Uh, so, you know, there was a little microcontroller, uh, STM32, running uh, some embedded C. Mm. Um, Never going to run on Plan 9. Doesn't even have an MMBU. <laughs> uh, doesn't need it. Mm -hmm. uh, but basically what I ended up doing to control the device was uh, was uh, exposing a 9P interface over a USB, uh, over dumb USB, mm -hmm. um, making the, and you'd, for example, control the various actuators that would uh, change the way that the waves were reflected inside the microwave by writing an angle to, or a set of angles to a 9P file. Uh, you'd read back sensor readings through uh, another 9P file. Nice. Um, so the actual 9P code itself I wrote from scratch, but the parsing of the protocol came from uh, uh, Plan 9. Hmm. Um, I just lifted, I think, probably Ken's code directly. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, and then on the Android side, because of course, you know, if you want to get uh, 
a cheap ARM, pro cheap and reasonably powerful ARM processor to run a reasonably capable Unixy system mm -hmm. on one of these devices. You go to a vendor and you tell them, hey, I want to get, say, a Qualcomm Snapdragon. And they go, cool, what version of Android are you running? And you say, I don't want to run Android. And they say, oh, that's nice. What version of Android are you running? Uh, so you say, OK, give me the most recent. And then they say, well, we've got one that's like three years out of date. Is that good? You say, is there anything that's newer? And they go, no. <sighs> Anyways. Excellent. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, so basically, the Android system was running some code that had been, that was lifted and di disentangled from Plan 9, nine port. Yeah. Um, and that was kind of doing all the communication on the Android side of things up until the Android app that ran our UI. <laughs> so there's definitely some Plan 9 influence in the stuff that I've done. Fascinating. That's so neat. That's so interesting. Um, a very, uh, I guess, like, kind of elegant solution going on there. I, 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 I'm quite intrigued by that. I like it quite a bit. Um, yeah, it was elegant up to the Android anyways. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just said. Uh, uh, just out of curiosity, and maybe this is outside of what you've looked at, uh, since you put kind of 9P on like kind of an embedded platform, have you ever looked into like uh, Plan 9 on an embedded platform or maybe even like Inferno since that's kind of what that was designed for though. Inferno I think has some creaky edges lying around it nowadays in the public version at least. Um, I haven't really had a need. So mm. for this kind of thing, Inferno's even way too big. Um, I had 128 kilobytes of RAM. Oh, I see. And that had to be able to run, you know, a whole bunch of sensors as well as uh, have a big enough buffer for protocol parsing. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I can see. And that. I mean, the embedded code that we had fit with room to spare. Right. But as soon as you bring in a garbage collector, right, or a runtime, or yeah. anything fancy, you kind of. So it's falling apart. Aren't man. happy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. That um, makes sense. And I, yeah, I haven't worked on an embedded. I haven't needed to work on an embedded system that was small enough for that. You know, an off the box Linux would wasn't the easiest solution. Uh huh. But then on top of that, we needed to do some. Like on this microwave device, we needed to do some consumer facing UI. Ah, uh, I see. Which means A, it's hard to hire Inferno programmers. Although, yeah. you know, I feel like the people that know Inferno well enough to be hired are also kind, would also jump at the opportunity. So <laughs> that's right. Yeah. I, I think. And, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and then in other places, I just haven't been in a position to make the technical choices around this kind yeah. of thing. Absolutely, yeah, that that makes sense. I think that's kind of where a lot of people are, yeah? Yeah, so. and then there's always the business question of how do we hire? Yeah, of course. Which is hard. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm glad you got to have some fun putting something like 9P in. Uh, yeah, it was also a great day when, you know, I'm not even in the room, and... We're tr and CTO, VP of engineering are kind of hashing out some initial ideas around design. And CTO goes, so how about we do this with 9P? <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> yeah, I actually ended up shooting that down because just doing Unix sockets was way simpler. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, it, all we needed to do is transfer one stream of data. Oh, yeah. So... <laughs> 9P sense. doesn't actually help there. But, yeah. you know, it was kind of nice when they were over-engineering some stuff and Cho their, cho <laughs> their choice of over-engineering was 9P. Yeah, that's nice. I yeah, I guess you can't even say that uh, 9P is a very niche protocol anymore. Every Windows install with that can leverage WSL now ships with a full 9P stack on it, piping together yeah. WSL and Windows. Yeah. yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Um, Although I'm, I would be willing to bet that that's uh, 9P2000L. 
or whatever. I, I'm be. pretty sure. I'm pretty sure you're right. Yeah, because it hooks in through like the Linux stuff, and Linux does the 9p2000.0. So yeah, so yeah, it's definitely definitely nice that it's kind of turned into the semi-standard uh, way of talking to virtual machines, though. Yeah, it is very nice. Yeah, because what uh, I think docker uses it kimu did something like that yeah yeah and it beats well i'm pretty sure that anything any other alternative would have been way more complicated than 2000 l yeah even if 2000 l is a lot more complicated than 2000 yeah <laughs> yeah 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 though i i think there might my, my yeah 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 I, yeah I, I mean it's all flavors of badness and this one's the least Bitter. Yeah, of course. Yeah, no, no, maybe not the best, but uh, it'll do. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe then also looking at the outside world a little bit. Uh, is there any like, because I, mean, I know. Uh, so I'll take an example from like the community. I know VD has like a fascination with like Open VMS and thinks Plan Nine can learn a lot from what VMS has done in the past. Is there, like some software set system or language or something that exists kind of wholly outside the nine world that you think that you like admire and respect to plan nine or just yourself or that you think nine as a community could like learn from explicitly. Uh, I mean, we can learn from everything, right? That's true. Right. Um, like Linux is well to pick an example that everyone knows and kind of Linux is not an elegant system, but there is a lot of interesting algorithms, interesting uh, approaches to things that they've kind of mashed in. Uh, so for example, uh, the whole RCU approach for concurrency is actually a really neat way of handling updates and uh, on mostly read data structures. Uh, which basically gives you, you don't even need atomic instructions, I believe, on um, on modern Intel processors as long as you can figure out the right grace period. Mm. Uh, so taking a step back, I should kind of summarize what RCU is. Sure. Um, imagine you have, say, network configuration. You almost never change your IP address compared to the number of times that you read packets and need to compare against your IP address. Mm -hmm. So taking a lock on every every time you look at the IP address so that when someone changes it, changes or does an IP config or whatever, um, would be kind of a big performance hit. Right. So what happens if you could free the, I, the old IP address only when you knew that no one else was reading from it mm. uh, and you didn't need to take locks? So what read, copy, update does is you have readers that just read from data. And the updater uh, does the update and waits long enough before uh, freeing the data. Mm. And how long is long enough? Well, there is a bit of sleight of hand. And for the Linux implementation, you really need to be in the kernel to do that. Mm. Um, basically, they then, like if you're doing RCU, you can't sleep when you're uh, reading. So that means that you can't switch process. Mm. Okay. So now, if you wait until every process, every processor has switched processes at least once before you free a data structure, you know that no one was reading from it based on that rule. Hmm. And because switching processes acts like a memory barrier, at least on x86, you don't even need to synchronize anything. Hmm. So you know there's a lot of clever algorithms like that that you can learn from Linux. Right. Um, in terms of other systems that are just completely different. And I don't think Plan 9 can learn from it just because they are so different. That's fair. But the idea of, say, early list symbolics list machines, mm -hmm. um, they, you know, I love the idea of basically your programming environment or your user environment is a debugger. Mm -hmm. uh, if something crashes, you can poke around, fix it. Mm -hmm. and continue the program, mm -hmm. pick up where you left off. Mm -hmm. um, your memory and... So I've never actually used one of these for more than like 
a few minutes in a general emulator. Right. So <laughs> I'm completely talking out my ass here. And Fair. anyone that has actually used this will probably tell me, this guy is an idiot. He's wrong. <laughs> what the hell? Uh, but basically, the impression, the impression I got is that you, know, you don't really have a file system. You just have live objects and live data. And you're interacting with it directly, right. possibly through user interface that you've written in the environment. But it's just like a REPL that you're playing with directly. Right. And I kind of really like that idea of having something so explorable. Yeah. Uh, you get similar ideas with the small talk systems, which I haven't used at all. Right. But, you know, that kind of sandbox feel is yeah. something that I like. Yeah, that makes um, sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there is a squeak port uh, to Plan 9 in the ports tree somewhere. I don't know if you ever saw that. If uh, you felt the need to scratch the like kind of small talky itch, um, I don't yeah, know if that's really I, what you're looking for, but I mean, I've seen it. I've just <laughs> I get yeah, yeah, I get it, <laughs> yeah. I get it, yeah. No, I've no. seen it. <laughs> um, um, who but... wants to give me enough money that I can quit my job and play with all the? <laughs> <laughs> I get it. Yeah, that absolutely. Um. And since you mentioned like list machines, especially, have you so going back to toys that no one has time to necessarily play with? Uh, did you ever get exposed to the uh, like interim OS project that was a an attempt at the fusion of kind of the list machine style like Lispy REPL environment stacked on top of so that everything is a symbol, everything is a list, da 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 da, stacked on top of the everything is a file of nine. I think it ran on like a Raspberry Pi or something like that. I have not. I actually don't think I've heard of that one. Oh wow. Okay. Well, I can. Uh, I'll, I'll drop a link afterwards. Uh, but okay. suffice to say, I, I it's not, hasn't been touched since I think like twenty fourteen, fifteen or so. Um, but this, uh, I, I don't remember his name. It's a bunch of M N T and M something like that. And he ha he's putting out a open source hardware laptop recently. Actually, is what he's been working on most recently. But he made this. Thing, interim OS uh, inspired heavily by Plan 9, though I don't think and I could be wrong because it's been a long time since I've touched it, but I don't think it's even really Plan 9. It's just Plan 9E and does the everything is a file 9P and then the default shell and way you interact with the system is a lispy REPL that's geared towards like especially file accesses so you get the kind of compounding universal abstraction benefits. Hmm. It's very okay, that's it's yeah. very interesting. Yeah, um, I should definitely take a look at that. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll be sure to pass it on later. I'm sure you'll get a kick out of it. Uh, if you can get it to run. <laughs> uh, so now I'm going to go back to so a couple of the submitted questions. I think we actually secretly covered a lot of these because we've done a really good job of like bouncing back and forth. Um, but the, this one's pretty good, and, and you can say as little as much as you like as always but uh where do you kind of see the future state of nine front uh over time as a project or even the plan nine community in a broader sense uh do you do do you see as like kind of a self-sustaining process in the future especially with like the kind of waxing and waning of audience and contributors i think we're in a really good place right now personally uh and we almost had the International Workshop Plan 9 conference this year, but obviously that has fallen through. Um, yeah, something, something it? pandemic. Yeah, some, um, some kind of virus, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I don't worry too much about that, honestly. Yeah? Uh, I mean, people come and go. Right. Um, I'm scratching an itch. Um, I hope that there are there is a, that there ends up being enough community that I don't have to scratch all the issues and, <laughs> and I can fool other people into doing my work. <laughs> right. Uh, but it seems like things are more active than they have been in a long time. Yeah. Um, partly because I think you know a lot of the tools to talk to the outside world 
have been either updated or written or fixed, um, partly because um, people like you have actually started talking about it and reminding people that, hey, this isn't actually dead. Right. <laughs> um, but, yeah. you know, I mean, it's... So it seems to be more alive than it will... Or more active than it was. Right. Um, there's... I mean, I'm actually not sure what the status of um, Nine Legacy is, but I know Miller's been doing some interesting work around uh, Risk V recently. Oh, yeah. Which is kind of neat. Um, I don't know. He got a he tiny didn't... EMU working. Uh, yeah, and, and yeah. it's apparently booting single core on some actual hardware. Which is crazy, yeah. It's like pretty awesome. Charles yeah. merged the Risk V stuff into the Inferno tree just like in the last couple of weeks even and has it working. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, crazy. Yeah. Yeah, and there's a bunch of stuff that was done in Adam kind of under the radar that I'd like to uh try either porting or bringing into Ninefront. Yeah. Um, so you're probably aware of D Tracy or right. Dick Tracy or whatever, right. uh, which is pretty much the, uh, our clone of D Trace, uh, let's you introspect and look at what, uh, various bits of the system call stuff mm -hmm. we're doing. Uh, nine Adam has something with, as far as I can tell, a much worse, much worse user interface. Mm hmm but much more flexible internals. Mm -hmm. It looks like from what I've seen, um, and I have to look at it more closely, there is a way of hooking into basically any function in the kernel and adding a way of, uh, it looks like it's abusing the profiling stuff to uh, get a get observation on it basically anywhere instead of at fixed trace points. Oh, wow, that sounds um, nice. Yeah, so getting that in with dtracy would be wonderful. Yeah, that'd be that'd be intense. This is a lot of strange things hiding out in Nine Adam. I feel like it's kind of almost forgotten. I don't even know if the downloads for it still work. I and I mirrored it years ago. Now I don't know if it's even changed since then. But there's so much like yeah. neat stuff. I think we imported the section what ten manuals. Um, yeah, I think those initially came from uh, Inferno, and then oh, I see. Yeah, section nine. Or nine, yeah, there you go, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so I think there are actually a couple that were still missing. I have to look at that. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> yeah, they came from that. Um, there's a lot of uh, decent stuff in there. Um, our UPass implementation on Ninefront initially came from Nine Atom. Right. Um, ton of bug, ton of bug fixes and improvements since, but. Mm -hmm. The initial work was nine atom, and right. that made it possible to open big mailboxes. Right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> was that... I know that on labs, I went years ago when my mailbox was much smaller. <laughs> uh, I had tried to open uh, my mailbox on labs, and right. that did not go well. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine, yeah. I don't remember if it was hours or days later, but I know eventually it, I know eventually it ran out of memory and just didn't work. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think I, I think I experienced something similar once when I had opened my absolutely uncurated university mailbox on like an old like nine labs image or something just because I was playing around and I think I had a very similar experience where it just ground to a, a lifeless halt eventually. Um, yeah. Yeah, interesting. Um, yeah, so I think, uh, I guess I have one more thing I'd kind of like to ask you about since I'm kind of surprised we haven't run aground of it yet. I was kind of figuring it would come up naturally, but uh, recently you got uh, Git9 self-hosting. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit maybe about how that went? I mean, you have, there's only so many Git implementations floating around, and... I know that I had at one point attempted to port what I think like libgit2 and had just totally given up on it at one point because I just I, I just like could not deal with the amount of like po ne almost necessary POSIXy stuff sitting around 
yeah. and you did basically a I don't know if I don't think it's the only but one of the very few I think clean room git implementations and not only did made a clean room git implementation but made it in a plan nine semantic kind of way with an fs and all that and then not only made it work for what just git added hj git for like kind of plan nine auth if i'm understanding that correctly yep um get over tls which is not even uh ubiquitous i think uh it's definitely a git nine thing Upstream Git doesn't support t- uh, Git over TLS. <laughs> yeah, so there, there's that, um, and uh, so much, and it's self-hosting and it's all of that, and you have a little self-host up and running now. Uh, how how was that? You spent a long time on that, at least yeah. in my memory. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, part of it's so. The reason I think I didn't bring it up is just because there's only so much self-promotion I, <laughs> I'm comfortable with. That's fair. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> um, I'm asking, so. Yeah. Um, I mean, so as far as libgit2, by the way, that's where I started. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I ported it. Um, I think the code is gone now because uh, Bitbucket deleted all the Mercurial repositories. Yeah, I... Yeah, <laughs> that was but, a nightmare. Yeah. Uh, thanks, by the way, for salvaging as many as you did. <laughs> I did my best. No. Yeah, I'm sure that I'm sure that we lost some because Have. it's not like there was a master list of everything. But... Of course. No. At least this time, when GitHub decides to delete everything that isn't sponsored or something, uh, we'll be prepared and it's all in one place. Yeah. yeah. Also, I mean. To be fair, if no one knew about it, it probably won't be missed. Yeah, yeah, sad um, to say, but yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so basically, I got uh, libgit2 working and then started thinking about what it would take to make a UI. Right. Um, and decided, you know what, forget this. A couple of years later, I go, OK, I really need Git if I want to use Plan 9 as my main system. Yeah. How hard could it be? <laughs> Yeah. Um, so I read the specs and the way I usually end up kind of approaching big projects like this is I'll read the specs and go, okay, that's way too much work and leave it percolating in the back of my mind and for a few months mm-hmm. yeah. and then eventually something will pop out and I go, wait, actually I see how I can do this. Yeah. <laughs> so the first you going from nothing to the first usable version of uh, Git 9 was like a month of work. Right. Where I, I could actually start committing maybe two months. I don't The Mercurial repository where I did the initial bootstrapping is gone. So yeah. I don't <laughs> know anymore. <laughs> That's okay. Um, but basically, yeah. That was the... Um, so going from no code to something that can commit to itself. Uh-huh. Um, didn't take that long. Um, the hard part was initially understanding all the file formats and getting used to the way that Lib9FS uh, works and so on. Um, I hadn't written too many file systems before, so, so this was actually one of the bigger file systems I've written. Right. <laughs> uh, and then just getting all that together yeah, yeah it was just you know yeah. you read this, you write the code yeah uh, paraphrasing what uh i think bill joy said about tcp <laughs> yeah 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 um so yeah yeah Did... uh, was there anything else there was something i was thinking <laughs> um uh, was there a part that just like you just cut out completely and said no we'll never do this um or I desperately don't want to do this. I don't want to be the person that has to do this or something like that. Um, there's stuff that I'm punting on. <laughs> uh, we, do, we don't have rebase yet, for example. Right. Um, getting something that will work if you don't have any conflicts is actually five lines of shell. Wow. Uh, it's just 
get all the commits between the two and then loop exporting pipe exporting each commit and piping the result to import on right. a different branch right. um, but handling all the errors is, and what happens if we do have a conflict and so on is something that I've just kind of you know what? I hope someone else will do it. I'll take the patch. Yeah, <laughs> I get it. Um, but there's nothing that there are a few things. Sorry, there's definitely a few things that I didn't want, like um, the whole staging area in Git. Uh huh. Um, it's extra complexity, but also it confuses people. Right. Um, there are other ways of doing it that I think would be better, which I haven't gotten to write, but. Mm -hmm. Basically, the problem that people want to serve with this or solve with the staging area mm -hmm. is they want to be able to do partial commits um, of data that and kind of yeah, basically partial commits. Yeah, um, and the staging area is a really heavy-handed way of doing it. That's kind of error-prone because so the, what happens in Git is you git add a file, right? and then you make a couple more changes, and then you commit. The thing that will be committed will not be what you had when you did the commit, but what you had when you did the add. Right. Um, and that is something that kind of throws a lot of people off. Mm -hmm. I feel like we can do this better in Plan 9 by having, say, uh, DivergeFS or something like that uh -huh. um, invoked before you commit. Oh, okay. You edit the files in memory get them to where you want, test them out, which is something that you can't do with the staging area. Right. God damn it, commit tested code. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then you can commit that and drop out of that namespace. And I think that would be a better workflow. Right. Um, so there's a whole bunch of little workflow things like that that I haven't implemented. Yeah. There are tons of features that I haven't implemented, partly because no one's asked for them, including myself. Right. Um, partly because I just would rather keep things simple. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, pretty much Git 9, other than rebase missing and <laughs> performance tweaks, is doing what I want it to do. So mm -hmm. I'm, That's nice. I don't feel the need to really do stuff. Yeah, with, yeah. Um, I, yeah. I've used it. I I used to have it on uh, my nine boxes. I think I, I I was a little addicted in a bad way to the ease of workflow I had developed around like uh, HTTPS commit. So it took me a second since that's omitted, and that's I totally get that. And I probably shouldn't be uh, using H it anyways. But oh, sorry, yeah. HTTPS switch commits. Uh, pushing like pushing and whatnot. Uh, that okay. should work now. Oh, it does. Oh, ex wow. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. I thought it was uh, yeah. not there, but no. There um, so we don't we can't serve over HTTP because that's a pain in the ass. Right. But um, Drew Devault uh, kind of made, made me do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, so basically, the uh, thing is that, um, well, there's the Git protocol, which is unencrypted on. Uh, Unsecured, so right. Drew refuses to support it, Fair. which is a reasonable choice. Yeah, uh, but that means that I have to support HTTP. Right. And WebFS just does HTTP auth. Oh, so okay. As long as your HTTP auth works, pushing should just work. And does that feed back through Factotum then? Yeah. Yeah. Um, neat. I, I, I mean, it's nice. However, go ahead. that's one of the things I like about how Plan Nine works. Yeah. The stuff just kind of fits together. Yeah, no one's reinventing every every little bit of every library. So, yeah. very uh, orthogonal tooling. Yeah, very orthogonal, but also, I think a lot of people kind of misinterpret. Well, a lot of people do minimalism poorly. Sure, uh, you need things to do enough for you that you don't need to reinvent everything yourself. Or glue together fifty thousand different programs, hmm. you end up with something more minimal. You can end up with something more minimalist if you pr make some programs do more, mm -hmm. um, because now you just 
need fewer moving parts. Right. Everything's a balance. <laughs> <laughs> I feel I feel like that's something kind of profound and maybe uh, a miss, especially in maybe like the POSIX minimalism community um, in a lot of places. Yeah. yeah. Very interesting. I appreciate that. I, I think we can turn over, if there are any live questions, I don't know if there will be, I can look in the Discord or Twitch chat. I don't even know how many people are in the Twitch uh, chat, but if anyone ha is watching live and has anything, uh, I have my eyes on Discord and Twitch and we can sit here and let people ruminate for a few minutes. If there's nothing else, we can close out. All right, give a few minutes to see if anything comes in. I'm going to guess that we probably covered about everything. Thank you, uh, Ori, so much uh, for this. I really appreciated it. I really appreciate you taking the time. Is there uh, anything else uh, you'd like us to go over before we close? Uh, can't think of anything. I'm yeah, yeah. happy to talk. Yeah. Uh, looking forward to hearing what, what some of the other people who've been around the Fondant <laughs> community longer have to say in the next episode. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm working on, I'm, you know, I'm working on getting people. I got charles to say yes uh in september and then i kind of went dark for a while because i've been away from a computer for so long but hoping that that offer still stands because i would love to hear what charles has to say too but i am so glad that we had this and i also look forward to what more we can get together so thank you ori um it's been a tr it's been an absolute delight i'll be putting this up as an edited audio recording and maybe trim it, trim down the gaps and sound a little bit. And I'll put an uncut version up on YouTube probably. So take care. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Of course. Bye. Bye-bye. Mm,